So today's topic is what we anticipated yesterday is typicality of entanglement. Okay, so let me say again what is our strategy. So we, ob we have observed the, the following fact that if we have a pure state, any pure state that can be written in this way, where these are the eigenstates of H, and I can't. I I call the probability of being in the I eigenstate, I call it PI. Then under time average, we get a state Psi bar, which is the completely defaced state, which is namely just the diagonal of P1, PN. And our goal is to show that almost always psi of t, when we observe it on a subsystem, is very similar to psi bar of A. This is our goal. Okay, this is our final goal. And yesterday I argued that things like this are possible because of entanglement, including the fact that in a subsystem entropy can increase. This is one of the things that is happening here, right? This is a pure state, but now we want it to be close to a mixed state. And this can happen in a subsystem when we observe it with a local operator because of entanglement. So that's why we are interested in entanglement. And since we are saying, oh, this happens almost always, this is what we mean by typical. So our strategy is to show typicality of entanglement. So now, with this motivation in mind, Let's proceed. So this is our final goal. So this is very not trivial. We require several steps. Today we'll do all of them. So now forget for a second about the Hamiltonian, about the dynamics, and comparing the state at the time t with the time average. Okay? So this is our final destination. But uh, let's start with something simpler than this. Let's start with the kinematical argument, okay? So there is no, no dynamics. We just do the statistics of entanglement in the Hilbert space, okay? So statistics of entanglement in H. Then, of course, these results will be needed to prove the, the, the the bigger goal, the bigger target, target. Okay. Oh, before before starting this, I want I want you to notice something. There is an interesting observable, which is a non-local observable, but it's very interesting. That is called the Loschmidt echo. L of t. Loschmidt echo is the probability that our state at the time t goes back to the initial state. Okay, so it is the modulus square of the overlap between psi t and psi zero. Okay, so this is the definition. This is called Loschmidt echo.
why this is an interesting observable? First of all, if this quantity has a profile like this, a time profile like this, so this L, this is T, then we are, are sure that we have equilibration in probability for most observables. Because it's the state itself that is always close to some typical state. The second thing is that its time average is very interesting. What do you think? Do you have an intuition about what is the time average of L? So it's this overlap, right? So, <clears throat> and I want to average over that. So if you do the calculation that you find in the notes, but it's a very simple calculation. It's the same calculation that you do when we did the time average, when we did the this time average. You find the sum of the pi square. But do you see this is this is the purity of psi bar. So the average time average of the Loschmitteko is the purity of the completely defaced state. So it's telling us how much under time average our wannabe typical state has become mixed. And it has a second it has a second uh, important uh, meaning this quantity. So when is the dispute is very small? When when the spirit is very small? Completely, huh? Completely mixed. Yeah. So in general, what? That is the, the maximum, right? The, the, the minimum. The smallest possible purity is when these uh, are all the same, right? One over n. But to be very small purity in general means what, what, is, what is telling this pro probability distribution? What, what is telling us? Spread out. Yeah, that the initial state is very spread out onto all the, onto a complete basis of our Hilbert space. So that it is not, in the initial state, although it's been pure, but you, you see, if only a few of these pi are different from zero, and the purity is therefore not, not too small, uh, then we know that the initial state was participating only in a few eigenstates. And because those are the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, it will not evolve outside of the Hilbert space. <coughs> right? The Hamiltonian that can only make you rotate <laughs> in the eigenstates. Okay, so if you don't have a component there, you, you, you can't. So, so the, the number of these pi that are different from zero somehow is telling you what is the effective Hilbert space in which the state is actually evolving. So for this reason, this reason, we could define an effective dimension of this Hilbert space. So a number that represents what is the effective, the, the dimension of the Hilbert space in which it is really evolving. And we also want to count in this effective dimension the weight of, you know, there are some eigenstates that count more than others. So we, we can define it as 1 over the inverse of this purity, so the, which is L bar to the minus 1. So this quantity will play a very important role. Because as a Remember, I, I gave you a counterexample yesterday. Even if I have a very good Hamiltonian, but if my initial state, the superposition of only two states in the, in the, 
of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, then you know every observable will just oscillate between the value of these two states, and there will be no possible equilibration, no possible typicality. So this number must be large. Okay? So this quantity will play a role in the future. Okay, now let's forget for a second about dynamics. Let's go to our kinematics argument. Our kinematics argument is just let's look at the state in the Hilbert space. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry. Is it one divided by L bar or L bar inverse? It's one over L bar, right? Yeah. Sorry, I I, I, I divided <laughs> <laughs> because I was I in back of my mind I want to write to the minus one because I don't have space then. Okay. Yeah. The important thing is always to make an even number of errors. <laughs> no. Yeah, all, all right. So the statistics of entanglement is the following. We have all our Hilbert space, and we consider this as an ensemble X. Okay. We pick states. We compute the entanglement of psi. And we average over all the psi in x. So this will be our average entanglement. And then we also want to know something about this quantity. That is the variance. OK? So we would like to see, first of all, what is the average entanglement in the Hilbert space. And second, we want to know if this, this average that must exist, right? The average in a set always exists. But we want to know if this average is also the typical value. So typical value means that the fluctuations are small. These are the fluctuations around the average. Is this clear? So this is, so far I could be not talking about the Hilbert space or about entanglement. This is a completely general statistical statement. I have an, an ensemble, I take the average and look at the variance on this, on this ensemble. But now we must remember that the quantity that we want to compute is the entanglement and that the ensemble is the Hilbert space. So usually, right, when, when we have some quantity and we're computing the average, what we mean by this is something like this. We have some probability distribution. Let me, for the sake of it, say that the probability distribution of the possible values of O is discrete. This is the average, right? If it is, if it is not discrete, it will be something like this. Oh. Yeah. OK, so how do we do this in the Hilbert space? So in the in the tutorial, we have seen it, right? And we, we discussed it. It's, we use the Haar measure. And so we know how to take averages. So the Haar measure is the measure on the unitary group. N is the dimension of our Hilbert space, OK? So dim H is N. And the main theorem is that if we have any observable Q, the average of this observable, so what we call Q, average over all the states in the Hilbert space, 
is equal. Okay, so this is a definition. I have the integral over all the over all the unitary operators on my uh, on our Hilbert space. So the mu u. Then we have sigma dagger u q sigma u, and that's it. So this is a definition where sigma u is a representation. So such that to u that belongs to the unitary group associates a matrix sigma u that is some linear operator. It's an endomorphism, actually, in H. It's a matrix in H. Representation. So what is the main theorem? The main theorem is that this integral can be written like the sum over the irreps, the reducible representation of this representation of uh, lambda i pi i, where this is the projector onto the i invariant subspace of the representation. And what are these coefficients lambda i are the trace of O in this subspace over the dimension of this subspace. The trace of a projector is the dimension of that of the subspace on which we are projecting, right? So this is our main tool. OK, so we want to compute. And now our observable is the entanglement. Yeah. Yeah, because it's the only measure on the unitary group. It's unique. So uh, there is no, if you find another measure, it, will, it is the hard measure. It will be unitarily equivalent. Means it, it will when you average, it will give you the same averages. So all the measures are the same. All right. As it's unique as a measure on the full Hilbert space. Uh, I mean you. Of course, you can define different probability distributions on the Hilbert space, but that they are not invariant under unitary transformations. So the only one that is invariant under unitary transformations is the hard mesh. So in the physical meaning is the equivalent of the postulate in statistics of equal a priori probability. The all the states have the same probability. So if you want to do something different from the R measure, it means that you are rejecting this, this postulate. OK. So as we discussed in the tutorial, uh, remember uh, the observable that we are looking at is the entanglement. You see, we know how to compute averages of observables using this theory. So unfortunately, entanglement is not an observable, but we discussed that uh, if I want to know the entanglement of psi a, I can use the purity as a, I, I can use the two Renyi entropy, but let's start with the purity. I want to compute the purity, the average purity. This is what I want to compute, OK, as a measure of entanglement. So average purity. So you see, I take psi. For every psi, I look at it locally on A. I compute its purity, and then I average over all the psi's. Okay. Well, we're seeing that a good trick to do this is to remember that the trace of psi squared can be written like 
uh, the trace of psi tensor 2, two copies of psi, times the swap operator that is swapping A and A prime. So we, we discussed this already. You know, you know what this means. So to, for this expression to make sense means that from H, I've gone to H tensor H prime. Remember that H has a tensor product structure that is induced by, by A, by the observables on A. So this is H A tensor H B. And this one is a copy of this that I will call H A prime tensor H B prime. And this swap A A prime is swapping the state, the state on here with the state on here. Remember, okay. Also remember that S A A prime can be written like the tensor product of S I, let me say I A prime with I in A and I prime in A prime. Yeah. I can just swap them degree of freedom by degree of freedom. Very well. So in the tutorial, we sketched, I mean, we, we wrote formally the solution. This average must be the trace of S A A prime, the sum over I, then there is some coefficient, and this must be, so I'm just using that formula, the projectors onto Whatever representation I'm using to do this average. But so what is the representation that we are using? Because I am in this, in a copy, you know, I have two copies, means that a transformation on psi, when I do the average, must become u tensor 2. This is the representation. I'm going quick here because we did it on the in the tutorial. And so we know that the irreps of this representation are just pi plus and pi minus, the completely symmetric and completely antisymmetric one, that are the identity tensor, the swap operator, over 2. And now mind that this is, these are the operators on the Hilbert space on which we are doing the average, which means this Hilbert space. So this is the identity on H, H prime. This is the swap operator that is swapping A with A prime and B with B prime. Yeah? Oh, yeah. Thanks, thanks, thanks a lot. Plus one. Yeah. Very good. So we need to, we need to, Compute these guys, right? The lambda plus and the lambda minus. Anyway, notice that the so you see the lambda plus, lambda minus is the trace of my swap operator. Which one? This one. This one, this is the one that I'm averaging. S A A prime. Okay, now let me do it in a simpler way. Let me do it in simpler. In fact, the way I wrote it here. So, of course, the, the, the trace, I can, when I, I average, so this is what I'm co computing, right? And then I'm taking this average over my state, my initial state. My initial state is some initial state psi tensor 2. 
OK. So you see that I can drag this inside here. And then because I, have, I can exchange basically the mu with the trace. And then I can cycle this inside the trace. So this is the same thing than taking the trace of S of my operator rho onto the, the average state, set tensor 2. So this is, this is what I've done here. I'm taking the trace of my operator onto the average state. So here what I'm averaging is the state. So this means that L plus minus is the trace of psi tensor 2 pi plus minus over pi trace of pi plus minus. OK? So notice that psi tensor 2 is in the symmetric subspace. So its projector onto the anti-symmetric subspace must be 0. Right? You can see it directly that pi mi minus over psi tensor 2 is, is 0. You just do it. Because it is the identity, so it's psi tensor 2. Then I swap the two cops, but they're the same. So I have the state minus the state, so it's 0. So we are only concerned with the lambda plus, lambda plus right? Uh, so by the same token, token, pi plus on psi tensor 2 is psi tensor 2, because it is symmetric. And the trace of a state is 1. So the numerator is 1. And then the denominator, so la let me write just lambda plus here, because we know that this one is 0. And the denominator is the trace of this, the trace of pi plus. So it is the trace of pi plus, it's the trace of this guy. So let's compute it. Trace of pi plus is one half. The trace of the identity, but the trace, what is the trace of the identity? N, right? But N on H, this is identity tends for the identity. Right? So it's N squared. Plus. Well, in the trace of the swap operator, do it as an exercise. It's an easy exercise. Is n. Just write it in a basis. So this is n over uh, times n plus 1 over 2. OK, so this is 2 over n, n plus 1. So. This guy here is equal to the trace of SAA prime. So we have n, n plus 1 over 2, the trace of SAA prime times pi plus, that is 1 of h tensor 2 plus the total swap over 2. And here, this is the other way around, right? Because we, we have uh, 1 over this. So it's 2 over n, n plus 1. Sorry. So the, these two cancel. Now, what is SAA prime tensor the identity? Well, it is S A A prime. So what do I mean by this? Remember, this is an operator on the full Hilbert space. What I mean is that it is S A A prime tensor 1 B B prime, right? This is what I mean. It's the usual convention that we have to not carry all these identities. But now we need to remember, because when we take the trace of this, the identity counts. Because now. If I call dA the dimension of, of uh, HA and dB the dimension of HB, the trace of this is the trace of this and will be the dA 
times db square. So the first part is, is, is this number. So we have, let me write it, n over n plus 1, da db square plus what is s a a prime times this s that I, remem I remind you it's a a prime b b prime. Well, you see, I'm swapping a a prime, but then I swap it back. So this is the identity. On a a prime, I'm not swapping. But then I swap just b b prime. So I'm computing this trace. And this will be equal to da square db. But da db is the dimension of everything. It's n. Right? n is da db. n is the dimension of h. H is HA tensor HB, so the dimension is the product of the dimension. So you see that this becomes dA plus dB over dA dB plus 1. So this is the average purity in the Hilbert space. It's an exact result. Now let's look at it. First of all, we are interested in the so-called thermodynamic situation. So the thermodynamic, thermodynamic case is when our subsystem A has still a statistical meaning, so it's not a few degrees of freedom. So dA is much greater than 1. But it's much, much smaller than the, the rest of the system. Okay. So we you are interested in this case. So sometimes you will find, you know, this formula may tell us that the entanglement is not much, but depends on, on the A and the B. So in this case, this is 1 over the A. So the average value of the purity, the average over all the states in the Hilbert space, if this is true, so for the, when we look at the system in this way, no matter what are the observables that we look at, when we average, so the only thing that we're asking is that the observable has a support on a Hilbert space that has this dimension, so it enters this formula only through the dimension, is that the purity, the average purity is the purity of the completely mixed state. So the average state is maximally entangled. On average, they're maximally entangled. This is uh, an interest, very interesting result. Now, we want to discuss the fluctuations, right? We want to know if this, this average is also typical. So before I do the calculation, do you have an intuition or an argument to argue whether the fluctuations should be uh, large or small? Why? Because you can't go any further down than one on the A. Yeah. What, what is this, this thing called? It's a theorem in statistics. It's called Chebyshev inequality. If you have a, it's because this quantity is greater than zero. <coughs> it's very, if its average is very close to the lower bound, to zero, it cannot fluctuate very much. But because it's, it's bound to be greater than zero. So a quantity is greater than zero that is very small cannot fluctuate more than its average, basically. The fluctuations are like the average. So because the average is small, 
when, when A is much larger than 1, 1 over the A is very small, then also the fluctua fluctuations must be small. Uh, however, we can um, we can give a much uh, better bound. The fluctuations are even smaller than that. This is a bound, right? So, so before discussing that, so we have proven that the purity, so the trace of psi A square on average, averaging over all the psi's, is one over d a. It so this state and the completely mixed state have the same purity. Can we infer from this that that the state psi a must be similar to the completely mixed state? Can we already infer it? Well, we need we need to show, we need to show it. But it, you know, we feel like that, right? They, they have the same purity. They must be very close. So let's prove it. Okay. So let me give you the the result of the proof. So the result of the proof is ob obtained in a very similar way. But I will skip it because it's. Uh, contains uh, some technical details that are very time consuming. So theorem, I think I proved this theorem for the guys in the winter school, so they can tell you. <laughs> the average of the norm distance between our state on A and 1 over A, uh, 1 over DA, on average, this is smaller than dA over dB, square root. So again, in the thermodynamic situation, also, so when dA is much smaller than dB, then also the distance between the two states is very small. So now we know that on average, uh, every state, on average, the states in the Hilbert space look locally like the completely mixed state. And now we want to know if this is typical. So is it almost always like this or not? And to prove that, we use a beautiful, beautiful theorem in statistics called the Levy Lemma. That is really a miraculous theorem. Levy Lemma is a very general thing. It's about taking the average of a function on a sphere. So let f be a function, Lipschitz continuous. What does it mean? That is continuous and its deriv derivatives are small, are upper bounded. Namely, that <clears throat> the difference between fx and uh, fx minus fy is upper bounded by some constant that is the same constant for all x and y times the difference between x and y in whatever norm you have on the space in which you are operating. So this is, a, this is a function from the sphere with some dimension. And let me choose as dimension of the sphere the number 2n minus 1, because I can, to the real numbers. And we require just this, that this Lipschitz continues. What does the theorem say? So it's a theorem in, uh, on the theory of measure or, or probability that is the same thing. I want to know what is, 
the probability that my function takes up a value that is different from the average value. So what is the probability that f of x minus f bar, so uh, this is the average over all the values of x, what is the probability that this is greater than a number epsilon? Theorem, this number is smaller than 2 x minus 2n epsilon square q pi cube, uh, 9, sorry, pi cube eta square. So you see that if n is very large, so if we are on a very high dimensional sphere, we can ask for a very small epsilon if the function is well behaved, so it doesn't vary too fast on the sphere, and we, this is measured by eta. So basically, eta is telling us you have to compare it with epsilon. It, it, it determines with which speed we can choose our error with respect to n. Then the probability that we are away from our average is exponentially small in n. It's called measure concentration. On a high dimensional sphere, all the points have the same value. Under every f, the probability that you find a value that is not the average value is exponentially small. It's, it's almost unbelievable, but it's, it's like that. So, of course, uh, This is it. So why this is important for us? What is a quantum state? So what is a psi in some Hilbert space? Let me call it C to the n, an n-dimensional Hilbert space. Well, it is it is n complex numbers, right? with the normalization. But what are n complex numbers? Well, are 2n real numbers? So it is 2n real numbers such that the sum of of xi square plus yi square is equal to 1. So the quantum states are points on a 2n minus 1 dimensional sphere. So are points in this. So every function that is Lipschitz continuous on the Hilbert space is such that the average of the, you know, the fluctuations around the average of that function are up and bounded by the a quantity that is exponentially small in the dimension of the Hilbert space because of the Levy lemma. So this is what we want to look at. So we know that on average, psi a is similar to this state. And we want to know what are the fluctuations. What is the probability that it's not so? So all we need to, to show is that psi a minus 1 over b a, this function, this is a function of psi, is Lipschitz continuous. Homework, if you feel like doing homework, prove it, and you will find that it's true. And eta is equal to. So it is Lipschitz. So if we wrap up and we put our result in a nice orange box, 
then we have that the probability probability that psi a minus the completely mixed state on a is greater than this number da over db plus some epsilon, this probability is smaller than 2x minus da db epsilon square 18 pi cube eta, uh, no, eta square already I put it in here. So you see the probability that the difference between these two states is greater than this number. That, so this is a very small number because we choose A much smaller than, than B. So here is where the difference between A and B counts. So the probability that this difference is greater than a small number plus another small number is exponentially small in the dimension of the Hilbert space, obtained by the square of the, our small number. So this means that we cannot make our number scale within, like, faster than an exponential. But who cares? We can make this error as small as we want, like n to the 1,000. We can make, sorry, this can pick epsilon scaling like n to the minus 10 to the 23. It's a mind-bogglingly small number. However, it's not enough small to tame this, because this scales like e to the n, which is, for large n, mind-bogglingly bigger than the inverse of this. So, mathematical result, almost all the states in the Hilbert space locally look completely mixed. It's in, in basically impossible that by picking randomly states in the Hilbert space, you will see a state that locally does not look completely mixed. All the states in the Hilbert space are maximally entangled if you pick them randomly, all of them. Which means that all the states in the Hilbert space locally look like the Gibbs state at infinite temperature. And I, I cannot do the details because it will take us a lot of time. But now you would believe that if it's, instead of picking any state, sorry, in, a, in the Hilbert space, I pick any state in a subspace of the Hilbert space, then I would find that typically they locally look like the most entangled state compatible with that restriction. So if this restriction is an energy restriction, so it can be any restriction the theorem still goes to, but if, it, if in particular I pick states with a given a total energy, then it must be the Gibbs state compatible with the total given energy. So the total given energy fixes also the temperature of the Gibbs state. So most states in the Hilbert space locally look like the thermal state. If I don't put any restrictions, they look like the thermal state at infinite temperature. If I decide the temperature, they look like the thermal state at that temperature. Of course, this depends on what Hamiltonian I've defined on my, on my system. All right. 
So as you can see, this is a beautiful argument, but it's kinematical. It's not telling us on, its, on itself nothing about psi of t going to psi bar. It's just saying that if I, start, if I have some state psi, then psi a is similar to one, the identity over the a. The identity on a over d. Okay, so now let's do the dynamics. So to prove the next theorem, so to, to give just the, to write down the next theorem, I will not make the proof. We need, uh, we, we can make these inequalities by using uh, the trace distance. So the distance between row one, row two, being one half of the trace. Oh, but also this one is the trace distance, by the way. So one. Oh, God. Uh, OK. So the trace distance is the same thing. So. Now what I want to do is the following thing. I want to choose any initial state okay so be careful now we have, we change something. We're not saying for almost all the states psi okay so the initial state psi is what it is a, 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 a. so what I'm saying is to for every psi. In fact, the result will depend on psi. And we compute the distance between psi a of t this time and psi bar, the completely defaced state. So remember, we wanted to know whether it was true that if this is psi bar, like in the Loshmi Teko, we have this profile. So we want to know, on average, looking in some different instant of times, how likely it is that I find the fluctuation, on average. So what I want to do is, how distinguishable is psi a of t from psi bar of a, averaging over all the time, infinite time? So this is what we want to do. And you can prove the proof is long, so I cannot make it. But it uses this, these tools somehow that this average is upper bounded over one half da square over d f psi bar. So any initial state psi and any uh, Hamiltonian such that as non-degenerate gaps, namely ak minus al is different from ej uh, EI minus EJ, unless some of these indices are the same. Okay, so this is the theory. So let's try to understand it. First of all, the result is true for every initial state psi, which doesn't mean that the result does not depend on psi. It means that we must find this dependence in our result. But the state is not true for every Hamiltonian. It's only true for these Hamiltonians. Hamiltonians that have non-degenerate gaps. So you know that every time you have some degeneracy, or also some degeneracy in the difference between energies, it means that there is some quantity that is conserved. If some quantity is conserved, 
if too many quantities are conserved, then my Hamiltonian cannot explore many states because it, it has too many constraints. So asking this means that my Hamiltonian basically is ergodic, that I can potentially explore any state in the Hilbert space, given that my initial state has components around. Question, you know, physical slash mathematics question. This restriction, so this hypothesis that we're making, how heavy it is? How heavy it is to require this thing? What does your uh, mathematical or physical intuition tell you? It's quite restrictive. It's usually diagonalized matrices. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Uh, the genesis are fine tuned. If a Hamiltonian has a degeneracy, any random small matrix that you add to it will lift all the degeneracies. In fact, you know that from perturbation theory that the only case in which you don't get a splitting is if your perturbation has the same symmetry with the Hamiltonian. And the random matrix does not, because a random matrix doesn't have any symmetry. So, only some special points in the space of all the possible Hamiltonians have the degenerate gaps. They are set on measure zero. Actually, you know, this is very realistic. If you require in a, you know, in a system that you want to engineer in the lab that you have some exact degeneracy or some exact degener degenerate gap, or the, you know, if, you know, not a small uh, splitting, but exact degeneracy, then uh, you're doomed. It's not realistic. You will never be able to do that. So almost all, uh, 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 almost all Hamiltonians are, are like this. OK. So we can say that for every initial state psi and for every real, real realistic Hamiltonian, this distance is upper bounded by this number. Now. Is this number small? Depends. You see, we have dA squared. This could be a big number. So this number is small. If dA squared is much smaller than dF, what is dF? It's up there. The inverse of our Lo Schmidt echo. So, as lo so this is how our initial condition enters. If our initial condition is such that our initial state is spread out on the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with just a few components, is, this value is not typical. But if our initial condition is random, so it's very well spread out on the, in the Hilbert space, so as components everywhere on the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, then this number is more or less the dimension of the Hilbert space. It is what it is, right? But it is closer to the dimension of the Hilbert space. And in our thermodynamic situation, this is a very small number. OK. But how likely, how likely this is? is? So what is the probability? that this df of psi is small. So I want to show you that this number is, uh, the de is basically the dimension of the Hilbert space, apart from a factor 4. Meaning that the probability that this number is smaller than this, this probability is very small. Well. How do we do that? We just compute the average Loschmidt echo, and then we prove that the difference between the Loschmidt echo, the average Loschmidt echo, and Loschmidt echo at the time t 
is a Lipschitz, and then we apply Levy lemma. And if you do that, we find that this number is smaller than 2 to the e minus some constant c d. So the probability that an initial condition is not very well spread out is also exponentially small. So this concludes the thing. We can say that typically, states in the Hilbert space equilibrating probability. It's ex what we said the first day. That this time profile for any observable on A, this time profile is very likely, it happens almost always, provided that A is local. So you see again, the local, all statistical mechanics stems out in the interplay between what is local and what is scaling with N. Okay, so this, this is a, a good point where we can wrap up. Of course, the story is not finished because we have just showed that A equilibrates in probability. We don't know yet if A equilibrates in probability to the Gibbs state, which is a, you know, a much stronger statement. So is this equilibrium state the thermal state? And we have many, many results that will require, that will require a couple of lectures more. But this topic is not completely killed, it's not completely dead, because uh, also the results that prove, oh, this is, will be like the thermal state are based basically on, on looking at the probability where you observe the state over infinite time. And this is uh, disturbing for two reasons. First of all, because there is a physical thing that thermalization happens fast. It has a time scale that we can measure. It's not infinite, and this method does not, allow us, does not allow us to find the time scale. Second, it casts a shadow doubt whether it's true that it can happen in, you know, in a finite time. You know, if we only prove that this probability, you know, this is almost always like the thermal state over infinite time, and it's only through le then, then it doesn't have any uh, physical value. So there are, there are uh, several results about more realistic conditions, so about finite time, uh, but this is still a topic of research. So you see, we, we have arrived at the forefront of research, studying a very fundamental problem in quantum statistical mechanics. The other thing about time scales that is important is because once we have understand, understood this foundational problem, oh, how is thermalization possible? And we solve it on the grounds that, oh, you know, it happens almost always. Then, we, if we understand the mechanism, then we are in the position of, of thinking, can we create some special conditions. So, you know, we are not using typicality. Can we engineer some special conditions such that thermalization will not happen, will not ensue? Which is very interesting. Because remember our discussion about the large Schrodinger cut of the quantum hard drive? This is what we want to do, is to keep a quantum system away from equilibrium long enough that we can do stuff with it. So a byproduct of this, of the interest in, in this foundational problem is that we get a better understanding on how to prevent thermalization. And nowadays, uh, 
and I wish I could have a couple of lectures more to do that, that is a big uh, attention on a class of quantum states called many-body localized states that in some sense are like uh, are the quantum version of a glass. They have a very slow dynamics. So they, they do not thermalize. I mean, they do not thermalize on a finite time scale. They, it's like a glass. And so, of course, people are very excited to, to see what we can do with them, what properties they are. And this also is at the forefront of current research. Okay, so I think that this concludes uh, the course. And in the tutorial today, we will use these things that we have learned about our averages on the Hilbert space, average entanglement, and try to apply it to the topological order and see if we can learn something about it. Okay.